absolutely lovely <laughs> bonfire night uh, so far. Um, even if you don't celebrate it. <laughs> uh, given that it is the 5th of November, um, I do apologise in advance if you guys hear any fireworks or things in the background or any bangs. Um, sorry, there's not really much I can do about that. <laughs> We've got the window shut, they still happen. Uh, so, how is everyone this evening? I hope you've all had uh, a wonderful day and hopefully got through that uh, midweek hump and are happy that it's only Friday left. <laughs> so, today I thought we would do something a little bit different. I'm hoping to do this uh, more or less every Thursday. Uh, for a bit, or at least just some art streams. So today's stream we are going to be doing a choose your own adventure book together and what will happen is uh, I've got this nice crackling log fire video looping and what, what the plan is is I will read the book and when we get to the major decisions, you guys will get to uh, pick what you're doing and we'll go from there. And then periodically, like if we get to an end or something interesting happens, we'll take a short break and doodle what's going on. So I've got uh, this art screen, oh, I can't really point to it, in the top corner. And what I can actually do is uh, switch between that and the crackling fire. So if we're drawing, I'll switch the focus to Clip Studio Paint so you can see what I'm doing. And then when we're reading, I'll switch it back onto the fire. Uh, but anything we've drawn will still stay up in the top corner. So hopefully that goes OK. <laughs> um, so quick introduction, I guess. The book that we are going to be reading today is called Danger in the Dark. I've put uh, the cover up, up there, up, up point, <laughs> up there. And uh, a little bit of background about this. So I actually had this book as a kid. I've purchased another copy um, because when I say kid, I mean, you know, primary school, <laughs> tiny, tiny age. Um, and I actually bought it from the National Coal Mining Museum here in Yorkshire. It's, if anyone knows their English history, they'll know that the north of England um, and Yorkshire was very big on coal mining. Uh, you actually go back down my family tree through the censuses, which I'm very fortunate to have access to uh, through another uh, relative who's into genealogy. Um, pretty much all of my ancestors worked down pit. <laughs> so, you know, it's, 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 you know, an important bit of history up here. And I somehow remembered this book's existence. Um, week or two ago and uh, I was desperately trying to find it and it turns out that this was actually written by the head of the museum uh, at the time uh, back in 1992 <laughs> so long before well a couple years before I was even born and um, it was actually only available Oh, I don't know if it's going to do this. Come on, hold it up. At the uh, mining museum. Fucking NVIDIA. Oh, come on, don't block it out. There. At the mining museum. And, um... It, uh... So, trying to actually find it was tricky. And eventually I managed to track it down through a very meticulous little database website that a single person's pet project, you know, they, they'd been maintaining for uh, 
last couple of decades um, of uh, game books, uh, which, you know, a lot of people call choose your own adventure books. And by some absolute miracle, when I filtered to United Kingdom and went for, you know, miscellaneous works by and checked through every single one, the very last one had this book and it rang a bell and I was able to, well, Needles very kindly got me a copy for a couple of quid off of uh, Amazon used. So I thought, you know, let's relive a little bit of uh, my childhood and kind of share it with uh, you guys as well. So uh, please do pitch in in chat at decisions. Um, given that this is very short, to be honest, and generally only has uh, a couple of decisions, we'll just, uh, we won't use emotes or anything, we'll just do, you know, type what you want into chat. Um, if we really needed to, I can do a poll, but I don't think it will come to that. So, uh, I figured let's just start up. So, uh, this is Danger in the Dark, a Victorian adventure story where you are the star. So it's by Rosemary Priest, and this book does have illustrations by Martin Grubb, but um, I probably won't be able to show you those with the uh, NVIDIA camera, but we're going to be doing our own, so <laughs> it won't make a difference. Um, so. Uh, it says at the beginning here, uh, Danger in the Dark, an adventure thriller set in a Victorian coal mine. You are the star of all the adventures. There are lots of different endings, only you can decide what to do, and the ending depends on your decision. This book must not be read straight through. You can have lots of different adventures, but they all depend on what you decide. You choose, and your choice may mean an exciting day or a horrifying disaster. At the bottom of each page, follow the instructions for the story to continue. It is your first day working underground at Moorend Colliery. You have a responsible job to do, and your life may rely on your skill and judgement. It's all up to you. Think about every choice you make. The safety of everyone in the pit could depend on you. Okay, and so... We shall begin. <clears throat> Just have a drink. <clears throat> so, number one. <laughs> it is your first day's work at Moorend Colliery, the pit where your father, mother, sister, and two older brothers have worked since they were young children. You walk with your dad and brother, Davy. To the pit yard, where men and women in dirty, patched work clothes are waiting to go in the cage down the pit shaft. Everywhere is black with coal dust, and as you watch the wheels of the headgear turning, taking the miners underground, you are very frightened. You have heard lots of scary tales about underground from your brothers and sisters. Uh, and then it says, turn to page two. <clears throat> A short fat man comes up to your dad. He is better dressed than the miners with a jacket over his waistcoat and a silver watch chain. Is this your young'un? He asks your dad. Aye, he says, and a good little worker, but I've our Davy with me and I can't take, ano and can't take another. The man looks at you and smiles, but the smile doesn't quite reach his piggy eyes. Well, you're in luck today, he says. We've got two jobs going, and as Dick says, you're a good worker. You can have your pick. Big Mick over there, his lass has left him and he's needing a hurrier. Or they're looking for a new pony driver, and do you think you can and if you think you can handle one? That's with Wilf. Well, what's it to be? It says, turn to page seven. So I think we're going to have our first choice. You look across at Big Mick, a giant of a man and very grumpy looking. If you go with him, at least you'd be doing a job you know. Your brother, Davy, has been hurrying coal for two years. 
pulling the coal tubs along the roadways to the shaft. Davy says it's hard work, but not difficult to learn. If you did that, you'd be working in the thin seam near your dad and Davy. Then you look at Wilf, who lives in the next street to you. He's just the opposite of Big Mick. Small and wiry, but he usually has a friendly word for the children who pass his door. You like the idea of working with ponies, but what if they might do as they're told? And you wouldn't see your dad or Davy all day as the ponies only work the thick seam. So, we have our first choice, everyone. <laughs> if you hear anything, that is props in the background, playing games and getting annoyed at them. <laughs> so, if we decide on the hurrier's job, we turn to page 16, or if we decide on the pony job, we turn to page 13. So. If anyone in chat has a preference for where we're going to go, uh, pop it in now, um, and we can decide from there. So we've got the hurrier's job, or the pony job. So, you know, do feel free to pop that in chat, I'll just give it a moment. and. We can have a look. Um, if nobody particularly fancies doing that or uh, people are lurking at the moment, that's also not a problem. I'll just uh, make a decision and we'll go from there and just make a note of what I've done. Okay, so I think we'll try. Oh, what's that? <laughs> oh, hi, duct tape. How are you? Going with the first option. Awesome. Okay, so we'll take the hurrier's job, uh, which is what I was going to go for anyway. So, <laughs> our first option, the hurrier's job, we turn to page 16. Uh, and I'll just have a drink. Thirsty work down the pit. <laughs> oh, it's fine. Um, it's honestly not a common word. Um, it's uh, H U R R I E R. So, to be honest, I have kind of forgotten exactly what the specifics of it are. <laughs> Is that it's probably been like 20 years since I went to the museum on a school trip and originally read this book and studied it, so <laughs> no worries. Um, I can also just put like option one or option two in chat. I... It's not exactly uh, many options to choose from. Right. I'll go with Mick, you say. Your dad looks at you sharply, and you wonder if you're making a big mistake. The man in charge looks both pleased and surprised. He's been wondering who to put with Mick because of his violent temper. Your dad opens his mouth as if to speak, but the fat man beats him to it. Well, that's your choice, he says, and your dad shuts his mouth again. Davy, behind your dad's back, is pulling faces and rolling his eyes, but it's too late to change your mind. You say goodbye to your dad and Davy. They're going down in the first cage. The fat man takes you over to Big Mick. Got you a little un, Mick, he says. Okay, turn to page 25. Mick turns to look at you and grunt. Not much meat. Hope it's an improvement on the last one. The fat man shrugs, pats you on the shoulder and goes, leaving you alone with Big Mick. He doesn't speak as you both get in the cage to go down the shaft. There's a huddle of men, women and children crammed together, but no one is saying very much. As the last of the clear sky disappears, and the blackness swallows you up, you are terrified. The cage drops like a stone, and as the dark air of the pit rushes up to greet you, you almost cry out with fear. You have to remind yourself that nearly all the children from your class at school have come to work at the pit. There are none of them in the cage with you today, and you wish you could have gone down with Davy. Turn to the next page. 
page. It takes less time than you imagine to rattle to a stop at the first insect where the thin seam miners leave the cage. You follow the dim light of Big Nick's safety lamp up into the workings, half running to keep up with him. All the miners are bent in a low crouch to avoid hitting the roof, and they keep disappearing as they leave the roadway to reach their workplaces. Big Nick has the furthest stint from the shaft. Suddenly, he stops, and in the gloom you nearly run straight into him. Then he bends low, and with amazing agility for a man so big, squeezes into a low hole in the side of the roadway, pushing an empty tub before him. Crawling on hands and knees, you follow. The fragments of coal and stone on the roadway floor cut into your hands and knees, so that it's hard to move without hurting yourself. Big Mick moves with surprising speed to his workplace, and in minutes he strips off his shirt and waistcoat, carefully hanging them to one side, pats his pick, and starts to hew the coal. Turn to page 37. 37. In a short time, he has cut enough coal to fill the tub, and you help to shovel it in. It's hard work and dusty. You've only shoveled a little, and already your back and arms really ache. Get this to the shaft side as fast as you can. There'll be another load cut by the time you get back, he barks. I'll give you a hand with that this time, he says, pointing to the tub harness. Then you'll have to do it for yourself. He helps you fasten the belt round your waist with the chain between your legs. Run, he shouts, giving the tub a push. You're off, crouched on hands and feet with the great weight of the tub behind you. Big Mick's push has given you a start, but even so, you think you'll never manage. No matter how you turn your body, the chain rubs your legs, so that in only a few minutes they're raw and bleeding. But somehow, by gritting your teeth, you're able to haul and pull the tub to the shaft. As you go, other hurriers appear in front and behind you, but none have breath to speak. Turn to page 43. You leave the full tub at the shaft and set off back with an empty one. You go as fast as you can and soon come to where you think you turned off for the workings. But is it the right place? There's another low roadway a little further on. If you don't get back soon, Big Mick will lose his temper with you. But if you take the wrong turn, you'll be even later. Both the roadways look the same. It's hard to tell which you came out of. You stand in the main roadway, trying to make up your mind quickly. So, we have another decision. It's quite simple. If you decide on the first roadway, turn to page 49. If you decide on the second roadway, turn to page 10. Uh, so, same as before for anyone watching in chat. Uh, first or second. Feel free to just type your preference. In the meantime, I will... Oh, Needle says second. Uh, anyone else got a preference? Give it another moment. Grab my pen and start sketching. No problem, duct tape. Uh, it's basically first roadway or second roadway. Which one are we going down? Uh, second? Okay, that's two votes for second. Let me just uh, actually sketching at the uh, same time. So, <clears throat> we are going for the second roadway. Turn to page 10. There we go. The 
The second roadway seems more familiar as you crawl along it. Soon you can hear the steady sound of Big Mick working at the coal. You are not expecting his bellow of rage as you get to his place. I'm not paying you to stand about all day. Where have you been? You'll be out of a job if you don't speed up, he yells. You don't know what to say. You thought you'd gone at great speed and every muscle aches. Fighting back the tears, you help Big Mick fill the tub again, making sure that no small pieces of coal fall in. You don't get paid for small coal. Then you're off again, Big Mick turning straight back to the coal seam. Turn to page 15. Where are we? 15. You try to pull faster this time, although already it seems as if your arms and legs are breaking. There's a tight band of pain across your chest, and the chain between your legs has rubbed great sore blisters. Your hands are cut and bleeding from the stones, and each time you move them it hurts. You know now why your dad and the fat man looked so surprised when you picked hurrying. On the return this time, you have no trouble finding Big Mick's roadway. The pit is already beginning to look more familiar. But as you crawl along, there is no steady sound of the pick echoing along the roadway. Turn to page 24. Hmm. Ah, I've got another choice coming up. <clears throat> you arrive at Big Mick's workplace, but it is all dark. You hold your candle a little higher, and to your horror, you see that the roof has caved in and there's just a pile of coal and stone where Mick was working. What should you do? If you run for help, he may suffocate before you can find someone. But you're only small, and if you stay and try to rescue him yourself, you may work too slowly. The rest of the roof doesn't look too good either. While you are still desperately trying to decide what to do, you hear a low groan. He's still alive. Okay. Our choices are, if you decide to try sa to save him yourself, turn to page 34. If you decide to run for help, turn to page 38. So our options are, save him yourself, or run for help. So I'll give you guys some time to put your decisions in chat. Um, how old are we again? We're a kid. Um, I assume pretty young? It doesn't really say, but we must be primary school aged, so probably something like nine, ten, younger maybe. Equal kid. find help then. Okay. Uh, anyone else? I'll add to that sketch. We are going to try and run for help. Turn to page 38. In a matter of seconds, the harness is off and you are scrambling back to the main roadway. 
You don't know where your dad and Davy are working, so you dive into the nearest tunnel off the main roadway to find the next workplace. As you crawl as fast as you can, you see a candle coming toward you and hear the laboured breathing of a hurrier pulling a full tub. Help! There's been a roof fall! You cry, hoping whoever is pulling the tub can hear you. The hurrier stops. It's a girl, Jenny Lane, who you remember from the class above you at school. Big Mick, he's buried! You sob. Turn to page 45. <clears throat> Jenny throws off her harness. She can barely squeeze past the tub to go back to the for the hewer in her to go back for the hewer in her stall. You go to the next place down, she tells you, and get John Redburn. He'll know what to do. You run back and into the next roadway. Already several minutes have gone by. John Redburn and his hurrier are working at the face, but they down tools straight away. They race with Jenny and her hewer as fast as the low roof will allow to where Big Mick is buried. Nothing has changed, although the dust has settled and it's a little easier to see. Everything is silent except for the slight sounds of the coal shifting as the two men and three children inspect the scene. Then to page three. Hmm. All at once, the men spring into action. The roof, which seems on the verge of a second fall, is propped with Big Mick's own timber. You work with Jenny and John Redburn's lab to shift the fall with your bare hands, and soon the colliers are working with you. Big Mick's head and arms are clear, but there's no movement, and it's hard to tell if he's still alive. John Redburn shakes his head and looks grave, but the work continues. Suddenly, he swears out loud. Ah, yon's a lucky one. You all look to see. A great sheet of coal, big enough to crush a man to pieces, has fallen slantwise across the body without touching it. In fact, it has acted as a roof to protect Big Mick from the worst effects of the fall. Turn to page 17. The men ease him out from underneath, and as they do, he gives a low moan. They say the devils look after his own, muttered John Redburn as they lay Mick, Big Mick carefully to one side. He's battered and cut, but at least he's not dead. Within minutes, they've sent Jenny for more men, and put Big Mick on a kind of stretcher made out of old jackets and pick handles. John Redburn turns to you. What shall we do with you, young'un? You can go out of the pit with Big Mick and it'll be home early for you, but of course there'll be no pay. And Mick'll not be back at work for a while, I'm thinking. He looks at you, considering. Weren't they looking for someone to work with Wilf? He asks. You nod. What's it to be? Or more Wilf. So, if you decide to work for Wilf, turn to page 32. If you decide to go home, turn to page 28. So, we've got a, another decision to make. Do we want to go and work for Wilf, or do we want to just go home? Uh, if I remember correctly, Wilf does the hip ponies down in the deep. Yeah. If we work with Wilf, we're a pony driver. <laughs> Need money, better work. <laughs> That's a, a fair enough approach to take. Um... <laughs> oh no, I want to stay in this job. This job's painful. Okay. 
<laughs> oh, we have a choice. So wait, we, well, we're, we're split, aren't we? Needle says better work. And duct tape says go home. Ooh. What do we do with a tie? If anyone else watching wants to chime in, then feel free to break the tie. Otherwise, uh, I will see if there is a... Uh, something that we can do. Okay. Let's see. <laughs> Someone's going to starve tonight. Well, I thought and Davy are still working. Um. <laughs> oh, it's fine. Uh, yeah, so what I will do is we've got a random choice generator. So I'll just zoom that up. So our options are go home or work with work. Okay. <laughs> so let us make a random choice. And it says we will work with Wilf. Okay. We are going to work down with the ponies. So, turn to page 32. It isn't a very lucky start for you, says Jenny, sent with you to the shaft. You shake your head, worried that people might think it unlucky to work with you. <laughs> it seems all right, that will, she ventures when you don't reply. Of course, we don't see the pony a lot here. Imagine trying to get a pony along these roads. It's true, even the main roadways are far too low. Jenny sees the onsetter to ask him to send you to the lower scene. Of course, he knows all about Big Mick, and he comes out to have a look at you. I'll see to him, lass, he says to Jenny. Go along now, or John will be after you. With a quick wave of her hand, Jenny runs off. There are plenty more tubs to fill before her shift is finished. Turn to page five. <laughs> Dad will be happy. We're bringing some extra money home. The onsetter seems inclined to chat. You'll find it a bit different down there, he says cheerfully. It's a gassy scene. They have to be careful. Mind you, Wolf's a good worker. You could do worse than him. For a minute, you think he's going to mention Big Mick, but the cage arrives, and in an instant you're dropping away from the thin scene workings to the lower beds. The onsetter at the pit bottom is less disposed to talk, and with a jerk of his head sends you off along a roadway which seems pleasantly spacious off to the low roofs of the thin seam. There is an entirely different bustle and smell. A constant rattle of tubs and pony harness, and a strong tang in the air. A combination of pony, fodder, and manure. Turn to page 44. Rounding the corner, you find yourself at the stables, whitewashed and lit by oil lamps. The stalls are mostly empty, with just a few ponies as most are out working. As you walk up to look at them, Wilf appears. I thought you'd decided against the ponies, he says, popping his head to one side like an inquisitive bird. You tell him what has happened. It's an ill wind, he sighs. You and I will do quite well, as long as you're a good worker, he continues, with a hard look. It's too late in the day to start you with a pony. Pick up that brush there and you can learn the first rule of horsework. Keep the stables fit for a queen. Turn to page 52. Hmm. 
You pick up the brush and start to shift the straw. As you work, you can hear rustlings and see bright eyes in the gloom. The mice come down with the fodder, comments Wolf over your shoulder. The place smells friendly and Wolf is a great change from Big Mick. As you clean out and get everything in order, you feel quite content. Then there's a sudden rush as the pony drivers start to reappear for the end of the shift. Boxer and Champion, Charger and Darky, Shiner and Tiger, and many more, all to be unharnessed and bedded down. But happy, you wait for the cage. Not sure what tomorrow will bring, but knowing that this time you've made the right choice. Awesome. So, that's the end. We successfully survived the day, everyone. <laughs> so, congratulations. We didn't die. <laughs> Book is biased. Hey, you guys just made good choices. <laughs> um so let me just find the reference image I was looking for. Because there's a little illustration here. Oh, you won't be able to see it. Oh gosh darn it. Hang on. Maybe if I put my hand nearby. Maybe... Oh, no, it's just not working. Um, illustration of... Down there, so... Ah, uh, ooh, that's gonna hurt, duct tape. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so we'll... Quickly switch back. And I just want to reference the... of this while we quickly sketch what has been going on. Ooh, ouch. That has got to have hurt. Very true. Poor pit ponies. As I can see, this harness goes across here, and there's just a chain under there attached to right there. how this arm is going. I'm going to Oh. 
Okay. I'll fix that in a bit. <laughs> Uh, don't think I'm not quite happy with where these legs are going. Shouldn't be there. Needs to be more front facing, and that is too far this way. Needs to be Yay for shortening Okay. We'll, what we'll do is we'll slowly work on this illustration uh, as we go, and then there'll be you know, a mountain of coal in here. Squiggle for now. <laughs> um, Okay, so uh, what we will do is we will take a very short break, uh, just for a couple of minutes while I uh, top up my drink because reading to you guys is thirsty work. <laughs> I need more squash. Um, and then, well, meanwhile, um, I'll leave it to you guys to decide. Do you want to have another go at this book or do we want to change um, and do one of the following options I have these are much longer <laughs> so I have Romeo and or Juliet by Ryan North or I have can You Survive the Zombie Apocalypse by Max Brelia. Uh, so, we've got Romeo and or Juliet, or Can You Survive the Zombie Apocalypse? I'll tell you what I'll do, I will run that as an actual poll in chat, and uh, then I will pop myself on Be Right Back while we do the poll and I get a drink. Uh, and then we'll check the results once I'm back. So, uh, I've got. What should we read next? And the options are. In. In. in Uh, not again. Uh, I'm here and Juliet and the limit. So we'll just shorten that to zombie apocalypse. Um, just run that for a minute. And there we go. There we go. So I will quickly go on to be right back. And I'm back. <laughs> uh, no, it's not a substitute bonfire for the 5th of November. It's just, uh, I thought, you know, since I'm reading, we'd have a nice crackling fireplace in the background to set the ambience. Um, and, you know, just add that little extra background noise, because otherwise me reading and then silence in between is kind of a bit meh. It's got to be a nice atmosphere, you know. Snuggle up by the nice warm warm fire and 
<laughs> Read some stories. So it looks like we've got a 50 50 split. <laughs> um, yep. <laughs> so, what we will do in that case is pop it into our random choice generator. So, I will just quickly do that. So, our options now are. Romeo and or Juliet or can you survive the zombie apocalypse? Okay. <laughs> that's okay. That's that I mean that's the whole point of a democracy and voting. Um okay. And we've gone for Romeo and or Juliet. So, switch that back. So, we'll keep working on the pit drawing in the meantime. No politics. It says in my rules, no politics needles. Seriously, go read the rules in the about. Even if I agree with you. <laughs> no politics. Um, <laughs> um, so, uh, I'll just quickly read you guys the blurb, um, oh, and I have prepared for this eventuality, so give me just a split second, change that, and... And, uh, oh, here, uh, we can unlock it. Ta-da! Oh, there we go. Ah, <laughs> oh, true, true. Um, you know, normally if it was people I trust I wouldn't mind, but I need to be fair and apply the rules fairly and I do not want any political arguments starting in my chat. It just makes it crap for everyone. Um, just in case. So, oh, I also need to uh, update our stream title. So it is no longer Danger in the Dark, it's now Romeo and... Juliet. Um, so hopefully that's updated the stream title. Um, it wouldn't show unless you refresh the page, so uh, don't worry if it doesn't just like magically update for you. Um, so uh, quickly read the blurb. So it says, what if Romeo never met Juliet? What if Juliet got really buff instead of moping around the castle all day? What if they teamed up to take over Verona with robot suits? Uh, in this New York Times bestselling version of Romeo and Juliet, you get to choose where the story goes. Packed with exciting choices, fun puzzles, secret surprises, terrible puns, and more than a billion possible storylines, Romeo and or Juliet offers a new experience every time you read it. This is an added bonus. All the different endings feature beautiful and quirky illustrations by some of the best artists working today, including New York Times bestsellers Kate Beaton, Noelle Stevenson, Randall Munro, and John Classen. Whatever your adventure, you're guaranteed to find lots of romance, epic fight scenes, and plenty of questionable decision making by highly emotional teens. Sounds brilliant. So. Are you sitting comfortably? Good. Then we'll begin. So. Romeo and or Juliet, a choosable path adventure by Ryan North and William Shakespeare. And you, because you decide what happens next. Not to mention all the artists who made some great illustrations. So really, there's a lot of credit to go around here, and that doesn't even mention the editors, designers and typesetters. All of him do important work that goes unacknowledged all too often. 
<laughs> okay. For mum and or dad. Okay. Hmm. So, we have a couple of quotes at the start here. A man can die but once. William Shakespeare, Henry IV. And... There we know. Oh no, sorry. thought it was Latin for a second. <clears throat> Devine, si tu peux, et choisis si tu lues it. Pierre Corniel, Heraclius. Hmm. Uh, Devine, if you... Uh, if you can, and choose... Uh... You something. I don't know quite enough French to finish translating that. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> let's begin with number one. As we now know, William Shakespeare, uh, 1564 AD to whatever he died, was well known for borrowing from existing literature when writing his plays. Uh, our previous publication, To Be or Not To Be, That Is The Adventure, firmly established that the award-winning play Hamlet, I know, turns out there are awards for plays, was lifted wholesale from that recently rediscovered text. We suggested then that To Be or Not To Be was both the earliest example of the Booker's Game genre, as well as the first instance ever in the then newish English language that was kicking around of an adventure being chosen by you, the reader. We were wrong. This book, which you are now about to enjoy, really is that earliest example of non-linear second-person narratives that are more fun than they sound. We did some more research. It's true this time. When Shakespeare sat down to write Romeo and Juliet, he had a choice. He could make up his own story, or he could flip through this book, Romeo and or Juliet, and just stone cold copy down what he read. As we now know, he chose the latter. This book he plagiarised from was lost until recently, when I found it again. It was just over there. Someone had put a coat over it, which I think is why we didn't notice it earlier. Romeo and or Juliet is presented here with the original text, unaltered from when Shakespeare stole it. All we've added are some rad illustrations, and we also put adorable little hearts next to the choices Shakespeare made when plagiarising this book. In that way, if you follow that path when you make a choice, you'll get the same play that Shakespeare ended up with. However, that's not the only story in this book, and honestly, a lot of the others are way better. Feel free to explore your other options, as there are over... Oh jeez, um... Hang on. Uh... That's hundreds, thousands, ten thousands, hundreds, thousands, million, hundred million... Billion. Okay. <clears throat> 46 quadrillion. 12 trillion. 475 billion. 909 million. 287,476 distinct adventures contained within this book. Thank you, Adventure Capitalist, for teaching me the numbers. Um, though to be fair, after the first quintillion, oh shit, quintillion, did I count all? I thought I got a hint. Uh, a lot of them are probably going to seem pretty familiar. Now, prepare yourself for what's called the greatest love story ever told, for some reason. Gingerly place your emotions into the front car of the roller coaster, strap them in tight, kiss them on the forehead, and then tell them you love them and that you'll see them soon. Too late, this emotional roller coaster just got started. Oh, this is going to be insane. Hmm. Oh, Romeo and or Juliet. Romeo and or Juliet. Wherefore art thou, Romeo and or Juliet? Right north, noted Shakespeare scholar slash enthusiast. And now we get to the first decision. Intelligent and well-informed reader of interactive fiction, what would you like to do now? Okay, we have three choices. 
get the book spoiled for you right off the bat. That has the heart next to it, so we're going to start immediately the same as Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. Play without spoilers, or learn more about the author. Um, so our options are basically start the same way as Shakespeare, play without spoilers, or learn about the author. So I'll give you guys uh, a minute or two to uh, uh, make your mind up. This as well. No spoilers? Okay. Uh, give it a moment for anyone else. Oh, I have another sip. No spoilers, I don't remember the original that well. Okay, two votes for no spoilers. So we will turn to page 36. We might not make it all the way through this one simply because well, we've got half an hour left. Um, so I don't know how long uh, that will it'll take us to get through this but what I will do if we don't is I will grab one of the bookmarks behind me stick it in place and we can pick up from where we left off uh, next week so you have just been born congratulations good work on that thing now surprise babies are boring so we're going to jump ahead in time to a point when you're a cool teen and you've already lived a reasonable chunk of your life. I can promise you that most of what we're going to see now will be flabbergastingly interesting. Flabbergastingly interesting. <laughs> Teens do all sorts of interesting things. They make friends, they shed tears, they totally make out, and other things too, probably. I think we can all agree that high school rules and is definitely the most important part of your life. So let's join this awesome stuff already in progress. Where you are is Verona, in Italy. When you are is Sunday, July the 21st, 1585, 8.18am. Who you are? Well, it's entirely up to you. Are you? Romeo? He's a 15-year-old teen who loves love, loves being in love, and loves being in love with love. They begin to love this guy. He's deeply, sincerely in love with Rosalind, who is smart and pretty and so perfect, OMG. It's weird we haven't mentioned her in the title, but anyway, Romeo's interests include thinking about women and also not being called up to the front of the class while thinking about women. Last year, he moved out of his parents' house and into a tinier house that his parents also own. Romeo's got a plus one perk to composition and elocution. That's like, talking? but a minus one weakness against moderation and foresight. That was a surprise, I know, right? <laughs> if you think you'll need to recite poetry in this adventure, he's a good choice. He's allied with Team Montague. Or do we want to be? Juliet. She's a 16-year-old teen who is a dainty flower, as fragile as a spider's web in the morning dew. Nah, I'm just having a little fun. Like, when you call a short guy Tallow or Dr. Heightsworth, Oh, sorry, Torlo or Dr. Hexworth. Juliet's actually super ripped, and her top six interests are muscles, boys, getting muscles, getting boys, kissing boys, and kissing her own muscles. Look, you can play as a boy who wants to meet a girl, or as a girl who wants to meet a boy. Each wants what- so each has what the other wants, and you can control either of them. Okay, this book is gonna be easy. The downside to Juliet is her parents micromanage her life and tell her what to do all the time, which leaves very little time for chatting up boys. She never gets to decide anything for herself, she barely leaves the house, and her nurse is her only real friend. It's a little sad when you think about it. She tries not to. Juliet has a plus two perk to muscles, obviously, but a minus two weakness against the mad hotties. She's an excellent choice if you want to solve your problems with muscles, and why wouldn't you? 
He's on Team Capulet. Okay. So our options are, again, we have uh, three choices. Uh, we can play as Romeo, which is what Shakespeare chose, play as Juliet, or it says, tired of reading the story already? Oh, wow, that didn't take long. There's a bunch of nice pictures on the cover you can look at while you wait for everyone else to finish reading this book. Turn to the cover, the end. <laughs> so, do we play as Romeo, play as Juliet, or turn to the cover? I will leave that one up to you. So basically, Romeo or Juliet. We have some rather nice illustrations. <laughs> this is a hard one. Romeo? I mean, Romeo's a good choice. Uh, see what Needles wants or anyone else who's watching. Let's give you 30 more seconds. Through and look at some more. <laughs> Julia, Romeo sounds like an ass though. Juliet is probably no better. Oh, oh, we have a tie again. Um, let me see. I don't think Proxy's watching so we can't break it. So, we have a tie. So, time to break out the trusty tiebreaker. So, we have Romeo or Juliet. Oh, no, that's okay. We're, we're doing this fairly. We've got Romeo anyway. There we go. Oh, Romeo, Romeo. Wherefore art thou, Romeo? Okie dokie. So. We are going to play as Romeo. 10 to 27. Okay. You are Romeo. You've been wandering around town since dawn. You were up early and sad because you are so in love with Rosalind. She's perfect, you tell yourself. She's a real grown-up lady. Beautiful, with legs that won't quit, and with arms that won't quit, and with the rest of her that's unwilling or unable to quit as well. But she's more than just a collection of limbs, isn't she? She's a full-fledged, awesome woman, and she's clever and funny and interesting, and you're certain that two people have never been better suited for one another. <laughs> My poor man, he refuses to consult a map. <laughs> the only problem is that she doesn't return your affection. Like, at all. Dude, you're not even at the, oh, Romeo, I like you as a friend level. You're at the, it's Romeo, right? Level. The... Listen, Romeo, I've, uh, um, taken the vow of chastity, level. The, hey, I just remembered this vow lost my entire life, so, um, sorry, level. <laughs> Regretting it already. <laughs> you can't figure out why she wouldn't bend the rules even a little for you. You're a 15-year-old boy who confessed your love to a woman in her 30s within five minutes of meeting her. What's not to like? All this walking hasn't helped you make any progress on this problem, and you're stuck on what you're calling stage one. Trying to figure out the precise series of sounds to make, emotions to emulate, and actions to undertake in order to make Rosalind fall in love with you. Because that's how romance works. You're pondering this problem when you spot three people in conversation up ahead. And they look like your parents, Charles and Rosemary, talking with your best friend slash cousin, Benvolio. Benvolio's great, and right now he's wearing this super cool vest. It's got, like, patches on it and tassels. I know that sounds terrible, but it's really working for him. 
I'm still checking out that vest. When your parents and Benvolio notice you standing there, your mum and dad abruptly leave while Benvolio turns and jogs towards you. Good morning, cousin, he shouts, waving. You pretend not to notice because you're sad and want to be left alone, and also because while Benvolio's a good friend, he kind of takes everything literally, which makes him not the best person to talk about feelings with. Actually, you saw Benvolio earlier today, only you didn't want to talk to him just then because you were walking around crying over your feelings. Oh, Romeo, wherefore art thou such a wimp, Romeo? So you jumped into the woods and hid while crying until he went away, because that's how you solve your problems. But there are no woods here. There's only a garbage can. What do you do? So our options are talk to Benvolio or hide in the garbage can. Uh, what do we fancy doing? Do we Do we talk to our cousin? Or do we jump into the nearest bin? <laughs> um, add to the drawing while we're at it. <laughs> oh, you two. He's clearly an idiot, Hyde, or heck no, go talk to the cousin. <laughs> okay, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to solve this with the website again, aren't we? Okay. Hang on. Hold on, we're we're going to the website. So we are hiding in the trash. Or talk to cuz. <laughs> no, but we'll we're going to carry on next week from wherever we leave off, so that won't be a problem. Um. Okay. We are talking to our cousin. <laughs> we will talk to Benvolio. Okay. <clears throat> Turn to 14. <clears throat> Benvolio shakes your hand repeatedly. Good morning, good morning, he says. You ask him if it really is morning and he confirms that it is, and you figure that's enough small talk. Time to talk about the important things. Your feelings. Let me level with you, Ben, you say. Here's my whole deal love someone, but she doesn't like me back. And Romeo agrees that, yeah, that sounds bad, and that love can be rough sometimes. What's rough is that love is supposed to be blind, but it can still see its way into making me do whatever it wants, you say. Personifying your emotions is an imagined third party whose tyranny allows you to preemptively absolve yourself of responsibility for your own actions. That's right. Don't think I didn't notice. You're about to talk about love some more when you realise it's breakfast o'clock and you haven't eaten since it was dinner o'clock. That was yesterday. So our options are redirect the conversation towards breakfast or forget breakfast, talk about love some more. Okay guys, so what do we want to talk about? Breakfast or love? I think I know which one you guys are going to pick. Finally, something we can agree on. Food. Okay, let's redirect the conversation towards breakfast. <clears throat> breakfast, you say? Dude, let's eat some. Where shall we dine? You're about to give Benvolio a chance to respond when you realise he has blood on his face. It's been there this whole time and you're just noticing now, you jerk. Although, honestly, part of the fault is mine since I'm in charge of scene description here and I didn't notice it either. I was too distracted by his cool vest. Speaking of which, I've had some time to check out that vest some more and I'm pretty sure there are some sequins sewn into it. It's so great. Can you ask him where he got it? So, we have three options. Do we ask him about the vest? Ask him about his face over breakfast? Or... 
Ignore the vest, ignore the face. My name is Romeo and I'm here to talk about love. So guys, do we ask him about his cool vest? Do we eat and ask him about his face? Or do we whine some more about love? It doesn't mention food. I'm guessing you want to eat food, duct tape? Needle says face, which includes food. Yes, it, it does sound like only the face. Right. Food. Okay, so we'll ask him about his face over breakfast. Turn to 38. You take Benvolio's hand and tell him you're going to this amazing little brunch place you know. Everyone loves brunch, obviously, but you super love brunch. You are so big into brunch that your middle name should be Brunch. But you spent several weeks trying to convince your friends that it's Dr. Lovesworth, so it's too late for that now. The quality of the eggs benedict there is off the hook, you say to Benvolio as you lead him down the road. They have twice fried bacon, that's insane. I'm going to ask about you about your face over breakfast. Okay, says Benvolio, a little hesitant. He pauses. I got into a fight at the... Shh, you say, pressing your index finger against his lips. You look up the road, uh, still shushing him. Almost there. You soon arrive at your destination. An adorable restaurant situated beneath a carved wooden sign reading The Merchant of Breakfast. Beneath it is a freshly painted illustration of what seems to be their new mascot. A smiling giant anthropomorphic egg happily frying up a regular egg. He's got a voice balloon. I know not why I am so tasty, he says. That's new. <laughs> you take your seats and wait a waiter comes by, introducing herself as Jessica and gives you menus. She's got a red and white checkered handkerchief in her belt. Everything's so homey and fun here. Looking at the menu, you see an image of that egg frying an egg mascot again. Only now he's saying, if you fry us, do we not become extremely tasty? It's a round of water. Can I get y'all some coffee to start? Jessica asks. Coffee, please. Two milks, two sugars, says Benvolio. And the pound of flesh looks good. Yes, I will have that. Bacon, please. Certainly, Jessica says, and turns. Uh, for you? You glance at the menu. All the dishes have cute names now. You're trying to decide between the eggs that many men desire, scrambled, apparently, the the devil can cite spinach and ham for his purpose, spinach and ham quiche, and the love is blind, if by blind you mean delicious, and by love you mean this French toast. A few moments of careful consideration, you do manage to choose your own breakfast. Let Jessica know your choice, and get some juice to go with it. I'll be back with that in the twinkling of an eye, sweetheart, she says, and she's gone. You and Benvolio look at each other. So hey, what's up with your face? You finally say. I was at the beach, you know the one by the lake? You nod. It's the best beach. Well, I showed up and dudes were biting their thumbs at each other, Benvolio says. I didn't know if the law was on their side or not. He takes a sip of his water. Frankly, he says, I'm not even sure why we have laws about where and when citizens are permitted to bite thumbs. Seems kind of dumb. Welcome to Verona, you say. Yeah, well, I broke it up, but it's still got a little bloody. Sybilt Capula punched me in the nose, so I punched him back on his shoulder and then stole his vest. That's justice, Benvolio says. You nod. It's justice, you whisper, eyes wide. Benvolio looks around the room to see if anyone else is listening in. What family and the Capulets keep fighting cars? I don't know, there's got to be a way to end this. I know just the thing, you say. Okay, so we have a choice. Do we suggest killing all the Capulets, 
or do we suggest marrying all the Capulets? So basically, do we kill them or do we bang them? Chance choice. <laughs> Marry were a coward, apparently. Marry? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So we suggest marrying all the Capulets. Then to 26. I appreciate how you tried to break up this fight, you say. But I'm a lover, not a fighter. Let's play my strengths. What if I just married all the Capulets instead? be in our family, and we wouldn't be able to feud anymore. And then the Capulet line would become extinct, assuming I required that all my spouses, male or female, took my last name. Also, we'll need to repeal bigamy laws, but I've done some research on this. Here you begin to pull out a stack of papers from beneath your shirt, placing them on the table between you. And I think that with a few years of concerted lobbying, real progress can be made. Benvolio flips through the papers. I can see you've actually put quite a bit of thought into this, he says, impressed. And I respect that you're looking into the long game, but I think this is one problem that won't be solved by you marrying everyone. Weird, you say, taking the papers and stuffing them back down your shirt. Just then, your food arrives. Finally, it's breakfast. Eat a tasty meal and turn to 32. Yep. <clears throat> Jessica appears at the table with your breakfast orders. You thank her and soon you have begun the mechanical and chemical process of eating, which is required to sustain human life. Without it, you'd be forced to rely on your fat and muscle reserves, and those would be depleted in only a few weeks at the most. The first step in eating is to carefully push the prepared egg dish in front of you into your stomach via your face. You decide to do this in tiny stages, one fork full at a time accomplished, you use the teeth protruding into the flesh of your mouth from your skull to slice and grind the food into smaller pieces. This aids in digestion. Do we wish to learn more about eating or continue talking? So our options are, oh no problem duct tape. Uh, needles, I guess this is your choice. <laughs> Do we want to learn more about eating or continue talking? to drink again. Mm -hmm. oh. Oh, pick up. <laughs> I will just... Uh... to this. So, <laughs> do we want to learn more about eating or continue talking? We shall continue talking. <clears throat> Turn to 23. Do the Capulets even have any daughters your age? Benvolio says, digging into the food piled in front of him. I don't know, probably, you say while chewing. I'm gonna marry Rosalind first though, just as soon as she realizes she wants some vitamin R. Vitamin Rosalind? asks Ben Rolio. No, no, Vitamin Romeo, you say. What's a vitamin? asks Ben Rolio. Listen, you say, pushing your breakfast to the side so that you can have some real talk. If we end this without bloodshed, we need a plan. 
a real plan. To do what? Benvolio says. In response, you slide your breakfast back in front of you and cut off a bite of your food and put it in your mouth, all while maintaining unbroken eye contact with Benvolio. You and me are going to end our parents' strife, you say, through a dramatic mouthful of egg. How? Benvolio says. Easy, you say. We spy on them. One of us tags my parents, the other takes the calculus. Once we know their secret hopes, dreams, desires, fears, and weaknesses, once we know them better than they know themselves, we use our knowledge to manipulate both people and events to achieve our goals. We'll guide them towards peace without them even knowing we're there. Ah, oh, I get it, <clears throat> says Benvolio. So the Catholics and Montagues will think they're making their own decisions, but we'll actually be the ones in charge of what they decide. We'll be like gods, or like people playing one of those choose your own a yes, you say, interrupting. Yes, we'll be like either one of those th two things. Are you in? Absolutely, Benvolio says. You signal for the bill. When it arrives, it turns out that Mascot is back again, printed at the top. Now he's frying an egg and saying, All that glitters is our golden egg special. Two served as you like them, with coffee or juice, and your choice of home fries or toast, every day before 11am. You say. So, do you want to shadow your own parents, or the Capulets? Ben Valio asks as you make your way outside the restaurant. I clearly know my own parents best, you say, but on the other hand, familiarity might blind me to certain things that an outside observer would see. It's a tricky problem, however, I think we can both agree on what the extremely obvious right choice is here. Okay, so the options are I'll follow my parents, you take the Capulets, or I follow the Capulets, you take my parents. So, just to make this easy, are we, as Romeo, following his parents or the Capulets? And this will probably be our last choice because, uh, Roxy is starting streaming in just a moment. So we will uh, make the decision and then we will bookmark it. So Needle says Capulets. Um, don't know if duct tape is back yet. <laughs> I'll assume still away. <laughs> and Roxy's dancing. It's too cute. Uh, Needle says Capulets, so hmm, we will go to the Capulets page and we will pop our bookmark in. Ooh, ripping Cathedral. We're following the Capulets, so we would turn to 30. <clears throat> And we shall pop the bookmark in, and we'll continue next week. So, <clears throat> thank you very much for joining me for some choose your own adventure novels and little light drawing. Um, it's been I don't know, really fun and really soothing, and it's really nice do and you know a little bit different and i hope you guys found it super chill so we're going to raid over onto proxy now since he's streaming some more control i believe yep and i will see you guys uh later this week so there's been a quick update to my schedule um saturday i won't be streaming myself but you will probably see me in all of the uh, multiplayer schedule that's happening uh, this Saturday. There's some special uh, like Saturday scare horror things going on all across the community. So I will probably pop up there. So if you're checking that out, I will see you there. Uh, otherwise, I'm doing a very early Sunday morning stream. Um, my usual Pokemon chill stream has been moved to 9am on Sunday morning. 
so we can start the day with uh, some nice relaxing <laughs> Pokemon Shield. Um, so I w and don't worry, Needles. I've got into a good schedule because I've got a job interview tomorrow morning. And I was up at nine thirty this morning. So I will see you guys uh, this weekend. Uh, have a very enjoyable bonfire night. Uh, try not to get too spooked, and we will be raiding onto Proxima. So let's start with that. Oh, three, two, one. Thank you very much, guys. <laughs>